just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? The Facebooking and the tweeting and the Instagramming, all that would not exist without our understanding of science. So it's amazing that you took that as an insult. You mean true for you is different from true for anybody else? Have yeah, to absolutely, because I can't think either got to be true or not. I can't, no, no. Good evening. Welcome to A Really Radio 109 for Friday, May 13th, 2013, Friday the 13th, where we dismantle the current events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations that'll make you go, oh, really. I'm your host, Andy Cowan, with my usual suspects. I've got Fred Sims, Stephen Griffith, and Daniel Atherton. Welcome, gentlemen. Good evening. Salutations. Glad to be here. Welcome back. Welcome back. Um, we don't have any particular audience feedback, at least not that I saw, so it obviously didn't get to me so hey you know what you can do if you do have feedback because we do make mistakes if you find one please go ahead and pause whatever it is that you're listening to us however that is and send us a note oh really radio podcast at gmail.com that's o-r-l-y-r-a-d-i-o-p-o-d-c-a-s-t at gmail.com of course also you can phone it in with your voice or with a text at 470-222-6759 uh standard rates do apply so we'd love to hear from you. I, you know, if you send us a voicemail, I will likely play it on the air for lack of content. I'll just put it on. I might not even care what you say. I may address it, however. So be careful on, on that. But, you know, you can put in whatever you like. Now, as far as um, rant segments and headlines, I had something that, um, that I saw out there in Internetlandia that was kind of, you know, niggling at me. Just kind of, you know, you know, what really grinds my gears that kind of thing. Um, gentlemen, do you have anything that uh, that was grinding your gears this week that you would like to rant? Because this does not just have to be my segment. It's my show, so I don't need to talk the entire time, really. <laughs> no, nah, nothing really caught my attention, but I've been head deep and listening to other people's conversations, so... <laughs> nothing that grinded mine. More didn't really get that much coverage, so would like to celebrate, but not grind. Okay, well, we can always celebrate good times, perhaps later. Uh, <clears throat> Fred, did you have anything that, that ground your gears this evening, um, this week? Much like yourself, I am um, ultra patient, ultra cool. Like, it, it, it would take a lot to grind these gears. Things <laughs> things just don't get to me like that. Um, good I, for you. <laughs> I do enjoy uh, the, the spirited debate. Um, got to have... What I thought would be one on a on a video that uh, Stephen had shared, but um, <laughs> it, it didn't really go anywhere, and it, it mainly centers around that stuff out of North Carolina and HB two and yeah. things we'll talk about, have talked about. I mean, there's yeah. it, it's a that crashed and burned pretty quickly. Yeah, it, because when you don't engage in the conversation, you know, it's like, yeah. hey, you put yourself out there, and then you don't respond to a simple question. Um, obviously this is all inside baseball. Find Steven's Facebook page. You can find the conversation, look at it, see how maddening it is. But it, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff, it's not like a grinding of the gears. It's like a, like a nice light sandpaper rub. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Polishing off the patina of the gears. Exactly. I don't need them to look shiny. Nice. Nice. Okay. Well that works. <clears throat> but, uh, it, for future reference, if you do have something, this is the segment for it, um, but this week, what caught my attention was uh, several articles about these uh, chicken farmer processor people uh, that were being forced to wear diapers because they weren't being allowed bathroom breaks. This, yeah. this kind of, it reeked, probably as much as all those chicken corpses do, uh, of things that were just not, not right. It's like, wait, that shouldn't be allowed in any industry, much less four separate farms. I would like to, I believe, express the general internet opinion of you. Yeah, salmonella everywhere. Um, um, quite literally. I'm fecal not gonna. Coliform. I'm just not gonna take this shit. <laughs> For those of you who, who aren't alive, the stream and are watching this later, I did in fact facepalm. That's that, good. That was not facepalmable. That was fantastic comedy, and the timing was amazing. 
I think I pulled my back. Or, Ugh. or I conflate my comedic abilities. One of the two. <laughs> it's maybe both simultaneously. It's it's all good. It's all good. Uh, this is this is one of those things where we're just gonna have to have to yeah. live with it. We're just gonna live with it, gentlemen. Um, okay. Well, <laughs> to to give you an idea, uh, Snopes finally finally uh, got a hold of this, and and they did uh, they did a little work on it. Not the best uh, reporting that I've ever seen out of Snopes either. Um, hmm. I've I've noticed that they can be hit or miss at well, times. I mostly, mean, they 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 just didn't address it really. I mean, they they tried, but they did not offer any conclusions whatsoever. I'm, so you can't scroll through this and see yes, it's they did true the, or... they did do this or no, they didn't. So I I would think that this is. Um, a work in progress. I'll give. I'll be charitable and say that they're still working on it. When did the initial um, article get posted to Snopes? Does it? Well, because um, normally, oh, the, the actually, article, I can just go there. The article itself came out uh, real recently. Okay, like, so it says yesterday. It so yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it yeah. So I would I would think that you're probably right and uh, work in progress. They're yeah. probably still putting things together and. Well, I would. Yeah, hope. It, it just hit drive time radio this morning. So. Okay. So. On the 9th of May, anti-poverty and social justice advocacy group Oxfam uh, released a report alleging that poultry workers were subjected to deplorable working conditions, among them that they were uh, routinely denied bathroom breaks and forced to wear diapers. There's no headline that you're going to get that's going to, you know, avoid the had to wear diapers thing. That's going to get pretty much everyone's attention. Um, yeah. So, Sensationalism wins. Yeah. Um, oh, look, a non-clickbait title. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's not clickbait it's, because it's it's true, but boy, is it clickbait. Yeah, disguised as clickbait. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> when re reality and fiction, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, a summary of the uh, published report titled, quote, No Relief, Denial of Bathroom Breaks in the Poultry Industry. Condensed claims uh, made by workers. Uh, chicken is the most popular meat in America. The poultry industry is booming, but workers in the processing line do not share in the bounty. Poultry workers, one, earn low wages uh, of diminishing value. That's an interesting statement in of itself. Uh, two, suffer elevated risks of injury and illness. Yeah, like the oh, salmonella yeah. and everything else. And yeah, the allergies from the plucking of the feathers. And um, Remember bird that bird, the bird flu thing? Yeah, that yeah, yeah. It's kind of there. Actually, and then the thing that's just going through my mind immediately, and just hearing and reading about this. Do we not remember the book, The Jungle? Uh, I don't think people do. Uh -huh. You know, that was required reading for me, at least. It was not required reading for me. Not for me either. What school that's... system? What? Uh, uh, this was South Florida school system. That was sophomore reading. Um, the jungle, which was like the the hammer that was taken to the American um, meat industry back in the 1920s, I want to say. Well, that was the 20s. Uh, we're in a uh, to quote another book, A Brave New World. Um, so they also suffer elevated rates of injury and illness uh, and often experience a climate of fear in the workplace. Okay, I got I to gotta stop you there because, I what? mean, this stuff just writes itself. It does. So they're a <laughs> bunch of chickens. Dude, chickens in those confined con conditions can be mean as shit. I don't think the that's... Boss, same as the old you, boss. You, you completely <laughs> missed it. Experience a climate of fear in the workplace. Yes, that's yes. We, we, we're moving past it. Yeah, we're, we're not we're yeah. refusing to acknowledge it. Nope. No, moving on, moving on. <laughs> uh, despite this, though, workers themselves say that the thing that offends their dignity most is simple. Lack of adequate bathroom breaks and the suffering that entails, especially for women. The top four chicken companies control roughly 60% of the domestic market. Tyson Foods, Pilgrims, Purdue, and Sanderson Farms. And they can and should implement changes that will improve conditions for poultry workers across the country. Oxfam had a 15-page report, which uh, there is a link among the links uh, that you can go look at. I'm not going to go through that, because really, all of this is worthless. You know, that, that's really what I've, I've come up to. It's pretty much worthless. <clears throat> um, the only, there, there were only two of the companies that got back to them. Uh, Purdue answered media questions, and, uh, and Tyson 
Uh, Tyson told reporters that report reporters reporters told reporters that some footage was available uh, for the company to review, but Purdue did not uh, provide a response to the question. Apparently, um, um, they said things that you would expect a company to say when they're being told that their workers are being subjected to poor conditions. Like, well, we'll get on that, but they didn't bother to tell us. You know, that's one thing. The corporate version of, no, they're not. Right. But also, do you expect anything less? I no. mean, they're not going to own up to this in with a microphone in front of them. You know, that's not... Hello, public relations, that's not what you do. <laughs> you, well, also, you, this mean, goes I've... to the C-level, and the C-level decides what comes down on that press report. And I've that... seen what... Like, I've talked to farmers and I've seen reports of farmers out there chicken and, and pork both mm -hmm. who complain constantly about these huge corporations that require these absolutely insane requirements for their farms to operate including typically the enclosed buildings and what is essentially you know inadequate materi materials and facilities in order to do all of the in order to actually continue the operation with the company like you know if you're doing chicken things you're probably working with Purdue or Tyson yeah. But they have this list of things you're required to do. doesn't matter if it's good for you or good for the chicken. They just want you to do it. And if you don't, they say, thanks, but bye. And you're basically out of a job. Your farm yeah. is done. You'll lose your USDA you know, approval. You just no. won't be able to sell anything. Yeah. Well, you have There's to have no, that in order to sell. To sell to. Mm -hmm. um, according to Purdue... They said the health and welfare of our associates is paramount, and we take these types of allegations very seriously. The anecdotes reported are not consistent with Purdue's policies and practices. Unfortunately, we do not have enough information to investigate the validity of these complaints. Uh, you know, that that's a perfectly reasonable statement. I don't like that then they say, you know, we were not given names of the people or, or even the location, because if they're talking about a climate of fear, they're not going to want to report because of you know reciprocation yep you know that they're going to lose their job if they report yeah. you know that's that's the problem yeah whistleblower laws are wonderful and everything else right. they say companies cannot cannot retaliate uh don't kid yourself folks uh they retaliate. blow the whistle yeah. if you have to it is obviously the greatest thing you can do mm -hmm. but realize retaliation is probably going to happen no matter what yeah Re remember this who's that guy oh yeah snowden <laughs> he was a whistleblower and, yeah. well, they're putting them up for treason. So there you go. Um, but this is the poultry industry. And if you're wearing diapers, somebody needs to know. So thank you for bringing this to the world's attention. Uh, I would also now like to take the people that have put this report together. I would like to direct their attention to two organizations that they really ought to know about. The uh, One is called OSHA. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration. It's part of the Division of Department of Labor and was founded in the Nixon administration uh, April 28, 1971. Uh, also, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH. Uh, they are part of the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and that is actually under the Department of Health and Human Services, and they were formed December 29, 1970. You know, so they're a little bit older. But really, this comes under... The uh, under OSHA, this particular statement about poultry facilities, and mm -hmm. there's even a poultry processing web page. Okay, employers must also comply with OSHA's sanitation standard 29 CFR 1910.141 that require that toilet facilities must be made readily available and that employees are able to use toilet facilities when needed. It is stated in the law. They can lose their license to sell that delicious chicken to all the restaurants across the, across the country. And, of course, to you at home. They can lose that if they do not comply with these things. So, no problem, right? Well, yeah, of course, that, that can be a problem because, as we said, there's reciprocation. But, you know, they, they also had an entire section, which I have here in the show notes. I'm going to post it. Okay, so it's how do I find out about employer responsibilities and workers' rights? Most of this needs to be displayed in a 
um, usually like in a break room, assuming that I guess you get breaks. But, you know, there'd be a break room <laughs> probably near mm -hmm. a time clock where you punch in. That's got to be there. So and that's going to have all the HR stuff, you know, you know, your workers comp poster with the same woman that has that, that her arm in a cast for the last 20 years. You know, that 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 poster that's going to be there. Um, but some of these aren't going to be listed on there, though they may. I don't know. I don't work in the poultry industry, so some of this might be there. Uh, the workers have the right to a safe workplace. The law requires employers to provide their employees with safe and healthy, healthful workplaces. The OSHA law also prohibits employers from retaliating against employees for exercising their rights under law. So you could sue. And if there's a whole bunch of you that are all being forced to wear diapers, you could do a class action lawsuit. And you would be named as, as one of the parties involved. And you know what? Attorneys love class action lawsuits. It takes them Yeah, because they're so much easier. Yeah, it takes them forever. But at least, you know, you would be in the system towards you know, some of your own reciprocation. Um, so you do have, uh, have the right to raise a health and safety concern or report an injury. Uh, for more information, there's whistleblowers.gov or workers' rights under the OSH Act, uh, and that's at osha.gov slash workers uh, index.html. Uh, there's also a phone number, o the OSHA offices uh, by state webpage. You can go there, or there's an 800 number, 1-800-321-OSHA, O-S-H-A, that's 6742. So just reach out, give them a call, you know, at least get their attention on it. Anything, you know, t with typical government agencies, think like th this is the kind of thing that they have to check out every report. Mm -hmm. There is a duty to follow through with these things. It would be just like uh, with the Department of Children and Families. If somebody calls in that there's child abuse going on, they have to follow up on it. There has to then be a paper trail. So... By making the call, you could probably do it anonymously. That You could definitely do that for whistleblowers.gov. And you can put in a note, and they will be forced to come look at it. That's probably the way to go. Don't give your name. You know, or, uh, hey, give give the name. Ah, yes. Give the name of your boss. Hmm. Pretend to be them and come That's down. That's just cheeky. I like it. It is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, hey, sometimes we have to work within our limits. And that's, that's a limit. So I, I've never heard of anybody doing that, but uh, probably because it works. Um, small business uh, businesses may contact OSHA's office. On-site consultation services funded by OSHA to help determine whether or not there are hazards at their work sites. To contact free consultation services, uh, call 1-800-321-OSHA. Same number. So uh, that's option four, though. Uh, so yeah, and there's and there's file complaints with OSHA. All these wonderful things. All of these numbers again. Call one eight hundred three two one OSHA six seven four two. That will get you there. There's e forms that you can you can file online. All of this. Be safe out there. There's there's ways to get things resolved. Sometimes the press is one of them. Viral media. That's great. You're definitely going to have PETA on your side. Yeah, <laughs> for sure, <laughs> because they were always on. Basically, they're just the enemy of your industry. So, sicking them on it might actually not be a bad, might not be a good thing for you, because then you would lose your entire workplace, not just your job. It's PETA. They're not actually taken seriously. No, they're not, but they can definitely cause some problems. Not to these... Disruption. Not to these four. These four are untouchable, as yeah. far as they're concerned. They're way too big. Yeah. They got the money because they got the chicken. They also have the lawyers. They do has the lawyers, yes. So, anyway, go find out what your rights are as a worker. You know, why not? Make the call. Again, pretend you're John Doe. Pretend you're, uh, you know, uh, your supervisor's name. Pretend you're his boss's name. Anybody in the company. You know, if you're clever, you can find their employee ID number. You can find that. It's usually listed in some corporate directory. Maybe it's signed off on your uh, on your time card. You know, yeah. You can do these things. I believe in you. You can do it. Okay. Now, with that, 
let's talk some history, because I am done talking about chicken. <laughs> Fred, go ahead. Yeah, um, today is Friday the 13th, so I decided to do a little, something a little bit different this week. Um, instead of doing, you know, specifically this day in history or this week in history, I chose to do this Friday the 13th in history. And, That's cool. um, so I'm going to highlight a couple of different things that happened on various Friday the 13th throughout, uh, our historical past. Um, the first thing being a uh, pretty famous Benjamin Franklin quote, uh, according to U.S. government documents in November 13th, 1789, Franklin wrote, Everything appears to promise that it will last, but in this world nothing is certain but death and taxes. <laughs> uh, we have uh, reports from the U.K. newspaper The Guardian that in September 13th, 1940, five German bombs hit Buckingham Palace and destroyed the palace chapel. Uh, this was part of uh, Hitler's strategic blitz bombing campaign, um, obviously very successful for him throughout the beginning of the war. Um, BBC gives us news from June 13, 1952. Uh, a Swedish military DC-3 plane carrying a crew of eight disappeared over international water in the Baltic Sea. Uh, this actually became known as the Catalina Affair because one of two Catalina rescue planes sent to search for the plane was attacked by Soviet forces. In 1991, the Soviet Air Force actually admitted that it had shot down the original DC-3 as well. Oh. Yeah. Well, at least they finally admitted it. Yeah, better yeah. late than never. Yeah. Uh, July 13th, 1956, the United States and Britain turned down Indian and Yugoslavian pleas to stop atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons, according to the New York Times. Uh, November 13th in 1970, there was a huge uh, South Asian storm that killed an estimated 300,000 people in Chittagong, Bangladesh, and it ended up creating floods that killed as many as 1 million people in the Ganges Delta. I don't mean to be insensitive, but I really, uh, my brain immediately translated that to Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. <laughs> Uh, Chitty I, bang bang. I think Chitty enough, bang enough time has passed that historical <laughs> jokes can be made. Okay, <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> Uh, January 13th, 1989, the Friday the 13th virus infected hundreds of IBM computers across Great Britain, uh, basically wiped out a bunch of program files and caused a bunch of anxiety because at that time, large-scale computer viruses weren't, you know, something that was known. It, they were pretty relatively new um, on the scene. Um, then you go to uh, that same year, further on down, October 13th, 1989, the Dow Jones Industrial Average underwent the second largest drop it had ever experienced at that time. It was nicknamed the Friday the 13th Mini Crash, and the Dow dropped 190.58 points. Uh, today, it's not even in the top 10 list of the largest drops the Dow has ever experienced. Nope. Yeah, that, that 100 and 190 points, that could happen. That's daily fluctuations. Yeah, that sometimes. could happen twice in a day. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's nothing. So, and uh, to wrap up Friday the thirteenth, just uh, an interesting tidbit: had he made it to his hundredth birthday, August thirteenth, nineteen ninety nine, would have been Alfred Hitchcock's hundredth birthday on a Friday the thirteenth. Nice beauty. Would have I been love fitting. that. That's awesome. Okay, I have. Uh, I'm going to experiment here. I have a little bit of music to play underneath the logical fallacy. Let's see if this works out. As I have to turn it way the hell down. There we go. Okay. Our logical fallacy this week is appeal to consequences. I thought this was appropriate due to the whole retaliation problem with workers. So, uh, however, this website uh, loves to pick on God. Uh, so, sorry, but, you know, that's where a lot of logical fallacies come into play. God can take it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, an appeal to consequences is an attempt to motivate belief with an appeal either to the good consequences of believing or the, co the bad consequences of disbelieving. This may or may not involve an appeal to force. Such arguments are clearly fallacious. There is no guarantee or even likelihood that the world is the way that it is best for us for it to be. Wow, that's a hard sentence, and with lots and lots of little words. There is no guarantee or even likelihood that the world is the way that it is best for us for it to be. Can't even make this up. Okay, believe that the world is the way that it is best for us to be absent other evidence is therefore just as likely to be a false or as true. Yeah, that's, um, 
That's really muddled. Yeah, it is. They should. They they can really definitely bad. clean that up a yeah. little bit. They need an editor. They need they need a better editor. Anyway, the this is essentially the whole Pascal's Wager Foundation. So, the, essentially, one, uh, if you believe in God, then you'll find a kind of fulfillment in your life that you've never felt before. Therefore, God exists. Appeal to the bad consequences. If you don't believe in God, then you'll be miserable thinking that life doesn't have any meaning. Therefore, God exists. Uh, both of these arguments are fallacious because they provide no evidence for their conclusions. All they do is appeal to the consequences of belief in God. In the case of the first argument, the positive consequences of belief in God are cited as evidence that God exists. In the case of the second argument, the negative consequences or disbelief in God are cited as evidence that God exists. Neither argument, though, provides any evidence for Santa's existence. Uh, the consequences of a belief are rarely a good guide for the truth. Both arguments are therefore fallacious. Um, the real-world examples, uh, of course, we could look at the... Um, the possible fallacious arguments of retaliation in the workplace, it doesn't always happen. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But again, to think that it always is going to happen is fallacious. Uh, each of the arguments above feature uh, real-world discussions of God existence. In fact, they have been developed into an argument called Pascal's Wager, which openly advocates belief in God based on its good consequences, rather than on evidence that it is true. Another example occurs in the film The Matrix, where Neo is asked whether he believes in fate. He says that he doesn't. Uh, he is then asked why, and replies, I don't like the thought that I'm not in control. This is not an appeal to evidence, but it is... Uh, uh, but to the unpleasantness of believing in fate. Fate would imply that the world is the way that I don't want it to be. Therefore, there is no such thing. So, again, yeah, they really need an editor. But I, love, I think you get the idea. I love the fact yeah. that both of their real-world examples, one is God and the other is a movie. Yeah, but we can't, those are the things that make the best sense. Cultural and, touchstones. Yeah, they're cultural. Completely. Like, it's a movie about what is essentially mo a retelling of the Arthurian legend. Yeah, not quite. Actually, it's the, the classic hero's journey, just done for a different age. He was carried off to Avalon at the end by an angel. Uh, it's still, it still actually. I don't think it's, I don't think it's strong. I'm just saying. If you look at me for me, it, it emulates Gilgamesh more than Arthur. I love you guys I mean, coming up with this kind of examples. <laughs> I'll, I'll take you down a totally different road because you guys are focused on the hero being Neo when, in fact, the one was Agent Smith. Yeah, I've heard that. That is, that is the argument I've seen. Yeah, it does make pretty good sense, too. Okay, so now we're into our new segment, but unfortunately we do not have Michael with us this evening, but I, we will do our best. So here we go. You must first invent the universe. If you're scientifically literate, the world looks very different to you. It's not just a lot of mysterious things happening. There's a lot we understand out there. And that understanding empowers you. If you base medicine on science, you cure people. If you base the design of planes on science, they fly. If you base the design of rockets on science, they reach the moon. It works, bitches. <laughs> so it's science, bitches. Okay. So, so I like this one. Yeah, go ahead. This one is, you know, it. you always have those workers who, you know, absolutely show no empathy whatsoever for anything going on around them or anything in their lives. They completely, almost psycho, like just psychopathic, just dead inside. Yeah. Maybe it's aspirin. Uh, science has actually shown now that uh, acetaminophen specifically, when you take it to reduce your pain, also might be decreasing your ability to feel empathy for others in both social and physical aspects and aches of other people's experience. Uh, this comes uh -oh. out of the uh, Ohio State University, where they found that when participants who took acetaminophen learned about the misfortunes of others, they thought these individuals experienced less pain and suffering when compared to those who took no painkillers. So it not only deadens your pain, it deadens your feeling of pain for others. Huh. Yeah, I've I. How old is this study? Because I've I've heard about this before, and and I know that it's it's just coming around again. So this well, this is, was published on May tenth of this yeah. year. Yeah. Uh, I guess it it was. 
Uh, maybe it was the same earlier preliminary findings of the study that I, s that I saw. Uh, researchers conducted two experiments, the first involving 80 college students. At the beginning, half the students drank a liquid containing 1,000 milligrams of acetaminophen. Acetaminophen, by the way, is the, uh, the, the generic of Tylenol. So a widely used, thought to be, you know, relatively um, low side effect uh, uh, painkiller. Non-steroidal, anti-inflammatory, in fact. At the beginning half, the students drank the liquid, um, while the other half drank a placebo solution that contained no drug. The students didn't know which group they were in. After waiting one hour for the drug to take effect, the participants, uh, participants read eight short scenarios in which someone suffered some sort of pain. For example, one scenario was about a person who suffered a knife cut that went down to the bone, and another was about a person experiencing the death of his father, so an emotional loss. Um, Interesting. So the, it was a, a 1 to 5 scale, uh, 5 being the worst possible pain. Um, yeah, so that that's very interesting. Um, so acetaminophen also suppresses your empathy. I think this is, uh, it could be more overreaching. I mean, yes, yeah, certainly acetaminophen is one of those, because a lot of people don't know how these drugs actually remove your pain. Mm -hmm. They don't actually work on the wound, you know. They're not making no. the wound suddenly feel better. They're making your brain ignore the pain. Or deadening they're, the nerves. Or, they're blocking yeah. the receptors. Uh, you know, if, if in the case of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, the NSAIDs, what they, they also do remove a lot of the inflammation, which does, does, it does work on the wound somewhat. You know, you know, especially if it's that uh, cut down to the bone. It's not going to do anything for your emotional hurt, or so they thought. I guess now you could take acetaminophen if you're just having a, a glum day where maybe your father died or something like that. You know, and they, they so basically... Uh, I know it's weird. Just maybe not quite as much. It's weird. You know, you might have to take more. Well, they do talk a little bit, um, you know, they, they say in there that they don't really know why this is working the way it is, but they, yeah. they kind of have an idea, um, and that comes to, like you were saying, they don't really know how the acetaminophen is blocking the pain, but there was a study done in 2004 where they scanned the brains of people as they were experiencing pain, and while they were imagining other people feeling the same pain, so the empathetic response to other people feeling the pain they already felt, um, those results showed that the same part of the brain was activated in both cases. So essentially, this one pill that's targeting your pain, you know, receptors is also targeting those same receptors that yeah. are feeling that for the empathy. For empathy. Um, I know this is one of those things where, you know, when you present it, it's like, oh, do you know the person who doesn't feel empathy, you know, or, or you know, presents as such? You know, this may be the reason. Um, I look at this in a totally different way, and it, and it may be uh, from a personal standpoint. Um, do you know someone who is overly empathetic? And who could probably use a dulling down of their empathy, um, <laughs> you know, who, who takes on too much and who cares about every little thing around them that that goes on. Um, yes, I'm talking to you, my lovely wife, as you listen to this show later. Um, maybe we should get you some <laughs> Tylenol because... I mean, it's one of those situations where the study is being done. Why is it helping or why is it doing this? But it, it's it's not really, you know, fully fleshed out. Is this something that could help people that, that overfeel? You know, it, it's not just one, you know, one street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm not a scientist. I only play one on the Internet. But what it what it appears to be that it's affecting the parts of the brain that experience the pain in examples where you're having to deal with another person we have uh, mirror neurons where we can kind of literally put ourselves in the shoes of another person because in most cases we've probably felt some right. of what they're feeling so we're just we're we're remembering exactly what the pain was for us that they that we think they're going through currently Exactly. So, but what that does is it probably fires the same parts of our brain that are now being affected by the Tylenol. So, it it physically cannot make you feel as bad as it would before. And so as even and as membrane is suppressed. Yeah. Well, the sense, the sensing is still there, 
but the experience of the sense is what's being diminished. Is, is being muted by the painkiller. At least that's that's my takeaway. And, and they're uh, yeah. studying ibuprofen, getting ready to study ibuprofen too. So they're going to be looking at other, um, you know, other pain relievers as well to see if it's all of them or specifically acetaminophen. So I mean, they, yeah. that's how like narrow this study is right now. They've noticed this, they studied it. Now they're going to branch out and see, you know, how unempathetic is our pill popping culture? Oh, look, proper science. Yeah, I I really imagine that it's probably on on most of the over the counter NSAIDs if not all of the ones that have the same effect of dulling our senses to pain. You know, mm-hmm. that would be naproxen sodium, which is a leave, uh, ibuprofen, you know, Advil's, you know, thing, things of that nature. Mama Van states uh, quite truly, and I was about to get to this, uh, that prolonged use of Tylenol can cause liver damage. Any, any prolonged high use of any over-the-counter medicine like this can't, it, it puts your liver in a stress situation. Uh, so just as a word to the wise, what your doctor would probably tell you, as they've told me in the past, is when you're on these medications, try to not uh, overindulge in things that make your liver work harder, too. So that would be uh, drugs, alcohol. You know, th- These are our filters for our bodies, so they're trying to get that out of your system. So anything that's making that filter work harder, eh, take it easy. Take it easy on it. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, if you absolutely are in just chronic pain and you have have to do something, always the same drug doesn't really work out so well. You need to change it up. But, you know, seek proper medical attention uh, for whatever scheduling because, you know, you shouldn't shouldn't self-medicate nearly as much as we all already do. We're all guilty of that, I'm sure. But, you know, if the condition lasts more than a week, you know, you probably ought to seek medical attention. How about that? Fair? Sounds good. Sounds good to me. Okay. It's like, anytime, gentlemen. Anytime. Speak up. Speak up. Dead air. God damn it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, maybe nobody thought it was fair for a second. We had to, we had to empathize with okay. your situation. And well, obviously, I've taken some Tylenol. Yeah, obviously you've I've, all been I've taking the Tylenol. Beer, and so I'm... yeah, there you go. You had nothing, nothing. Okay, so on to the next uh, next topic here. We've got uh, Canada's hot. Increasingly deadly wildfires definitely affected by global warming. Who could have possibly guessed that longer, hotter summer seasons uh, lead to drier forests and worse fires? Shocking, shocking, Not shocking. Donald Trump. <sighs> so this is... Uh, Why is logic surprising? <laughs> in RD Mag, uh, it's not just Alberta. Warming, fo- warming-fueled warming fires are increasing. Uh, so Alberta, of course, is in Canada. But earlier yeah, this year... Uh, we, there's a number of... Uh, Forest fires that are up there that have actually devastated communities. Uh, a a subset of stories coming out of the area is a lot of the Syrian refugees that have been taken in by Canada are leading the relief effort for those who have lost their homes. Wow. See, it worked out well for them. There you go. Good for them. Uh, I love this from here. It's a, it got so bad in 2009, Australia added a bright red catastrophic to its fire warning index. Oh, wow. It got so bad they had to add another color. Yes. We've gone to plaid. (laughs) We're about to get there. Oh, they were going to ludicrous speed. Interesting. Uh, Yeah. I mean, look at this. I mean, how often do you think of Siberia being on fire? But apparently it was. Siberia. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, In terms of acreage burned, the worldwide total may be dropping because of better firefighting. But in North America and Siberia, fires have grown quite a bit due to warming. Columbia University climate and ecology scientist Park Williams wrote in an email, quote, My estimate is that global warming has been responsible for about half of this increase. That's a significant amount. Uh, For the U.S., Uh, The 10-year average number of acres burned in wildfires has more than doubled from about 3 million acres in the mid-1980s to 7 million acres now, according to an analysis of government data by the Associated Press. Twelve years before Fort Mercury fire uh, set northern Alberta ablaze, a study by Flanning 
Flanagan and University of Victoria climate scientist Andrew Weaver found that human-induced climate change has had a detectable influence on a dramatic increase in wildfires in Canada. Flanagan said the area burned in Canada has doubled since the 1970s, and we think that's due to climate change. So. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Oh, uh, quote down at the bottom, this is absolutely a harbinger of things to come, said uh, Canadian climate scientist Weaver, now a Green Party legislator in the British Columbia Parliament. Again, I'm waiting for the summer for our state to just spontaneously, (laughs) boom, burst into flames one day. Some of it will, I'm sure. Certainly. Yeah, I have yet to experience a summer where there wasn't wildfires. <laughs> okay, but apparently it's not all bad news. Germany has jumped on the green train so hard that the, co- the power cost uh, the country nothing for a few hours on Sunday. Anyone who tries to tell you that renewable energy just isn't reliable enough for large-scale power grids is lying to you, says Mike. Um Yes, uh, thanks to a sunny and windy day at one point around 1 p.m., the country's solar, wind, hydro, and biomass plants were supplying basically 87% of the electricity being consumed. Yeah. I had, uh, I had also another link that I had sent out to, uh, to our good Mr. Mike about this that I'll, I will pull up here in a moment. But it was, uh, I believe Denmark actually had, uh, you know, where they were saying 87%. Uh, it was 110 percent. Whoo! Well, actually, to bring up a point when you're bringing up Denmark, Denmark and the Netherlands have very, very similar policies uh, put in place by their governments, where they're pushing uh, in their laws renewable energy um, to the point where I know uh, in the city of Copenhagen, um, almost every new building has to have a rooftop garden and solar panels. Also, Andy, your numbers are actually slightly off. I found the article. It's actually a link inside that article. Um, on a usually windy day, Denmark found itself producing 116% of its national electricity needs from wind turbines. By 3 a.m. on Friday, when electricity demand dropped, the figure had risen to 140%. Got it. <laughs> so it was just outsourcing energy that it was getting because it was more than the country needed. Well, yep, that's brilliant. That's making the country money. At least just for that. At least for that short time period. Yeah, because just, just remember, it's surge renewable pricing. Renewable energy doesn't work. What's that? Just remember, renewable energy doesn't work. No, no, not at all. Not at all. But you know, the, all those fans—they're going to suck up all the wind, and then they're going to slow. They're going to slow the planet. Yep. Totally. And of course, solar panels are going to drain the sun. I yep. am face palming so hard it's hurting my eyes. Well, don't don't hurt your eyes. Don't hurt your eyes. But yeah, so we've got uh, we got those links. I'll uh, I'll drop this one also in the show notes so you can enjoy. Um, brilliant, I, just brilliant. Yeah, I thought the Denmark one was uh, was ex- yeah, extremely just, interesting. Jesus. Yeah, one hundred and forty percent. Woohoo! Uh, so let's see who Bring says. That here. What's that? Bring, Bring it here. That here. You know, um, I believe there was there was another one on Texas actually that uh, that they were also producing a lot. Uh, let's see, where is that? Seeing a lot of the same uh, articles. Same, yeah. Well, no, the same pictures. You know, on the articles. So I'm 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 scanning Bizarre. scanning the thumbnails, and it's like, wait, that's the same image. You're using the same stock photography. Stop that. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay, moving along, moving along. Uh, but, yeah, it is happening here in the States, too. Uh, states with an awful lot of land and not a lot of people on that land, you know, yeah, they're putting up wind turbines, and they're, they're finding that they are getting quite a return on it. So it's not a bad thing at all. Uh, who says you can't predict the outcome of a horse race? Not us, says Swarm Intelligence. Tech companies unanimous used uh, the all-new AI to win a 540-to-1 odds Superfecta bet for the Kentucky Derby. So oh, they won? Yeah. Um, well, the good idea for that is the, the professor who did this as a test put a $20 bet down and won over 10000 <laughs> 
The reward oh. for guessing the Superfecta are quite lucrative, earning uh, UNU inventor Louis Rosenberg $10,842 payout from a $20 bet, and Tech Republic uh, reporter Hope Reese uh, $542.10 from $1. That's... That's top four finishers is a superfecta. That's yeah. a lot. That's a lot of money. <laughs> and they're not going to be allowed to do this ever again. No, probably not. But at the same time, would anyone be able to stop them? Okay, so let's learn more about this swarm intelligence thing. Okay, how does this process work. UNU uses a unique form of artificial intelligence called swarm intelligence, which seeks to amplify rather than replace human intelligence. In this case, a small a, a group of people logged into UNU online forum uh, through their smartphone or computer. Upon doing so, they are presented with a question and a set of possible answers. Each participant has control of a graphical magnet that can be used to drag a puck across the screen to an answer that he or she believes is correct. Here is where things get interesting, as if that wasn't already kind of interesting. There is only one puck, and it can only fall on one answer, meaning that the group has to collectively agree on a decision that best suits them all. What's more, the group has uh, the group only has 60 seconds to reply uh, to reach any single verdict. As one might expect from the name, this application of swarm intelligence finds its inspiration from bees, specifically how the insects use their own brand of swarm intelligence to find a new home. UNU's algorithm works in a similar fashion by tapping into the collective knowledge and intuition to give a unified voice based on compromise. While UNU can clearly be used for gambling, as seen in the experiment, Rosenberg hopes to use the platform in other sectors like healthcare and politics. For example, a group of doctors could use the platform to make more accurate diagnoses, while politicians could use it to make policy decisions. Politicians have conflicting values, but not conflicting knowledge, Rosenberg says. Uh, forcing, forcing polarized groups into a swarm allows them to find the answer that most people are satisfied with. Our vision is to enable the power of group intelligence for everybody. I like the idea. That, if it was implemented mm. properly, would allow us to collectively decide on anything. Mm -hmm. I'd be interesting to know more what the questions were with the possible answers. And the reason why, um, having done a little quick research, yeah. the horses they picked, and while they picked them in the order... And they, they did pick them in the correct order. Those were the four favorites. So essentially this group of 20 just picked the four favorites. And I'll give you the favorites in order. Uh, Nyquist, who won, was the overall favorite. Exaggerator, who placed uh, second, was the second overall, you know, the next highest favorite. And then uh, Mohamed uh, was the third overall favorite, but literally the same exact odds as Gunrunner. So Gunrunner and Mohamed switched. Gunrunner finished third. Mohamed finished fourth. So they correctly predicted it, but they predicted it by picking the four favorites. So I, I'm curious to know those questions, hmm. you know, how they got to those. Because, I mean, if you have a bunch of people who don't know anything about horse racing and they're presented with the odds and they're just, oh, look, he's the best. Oh, no, this one's the best. And then you have that situation yeah. where Mohamed and Gunrunner have the same odds. It's which name do I like the best? You know, it. so how did you come to those answers? And, and they don't really provide that in there. It's just a, a bunch of people all decided together because it's the only way to actually decide which order they came in, and it just so happens to line up with the favorite odds for that race. Well, in the experiment, the company enrolled 20 participants who used the software to narrow the field of 20 horses uh, down to four top picks. So they started with, with the 20. Right. Uh, participants then used the software, which was previously predicted Oscars, Super Bowl, blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah, Nyquist, Exaggerator, Gunrunner, and Mohamed. Interesting. Uh, as with any study, the way the the questions are presented matters a lot. So presentation is key. How they're phrased is key. 
Especially but, when you're dealing with a large group of people and you're talking about that swarm intelligence, you yeah. only have so long to, to you know, it's, what does it say in there? You, you have to pick them within... This would be like, um, imagine uh, our caucuses. Imagine if they were done like this. You have an entire day to move that puck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and you wouldn't have to be at the polling location. You just have to have your smartphone with you. So you, mm -hmm. could, you could actually participate. Except I don't think it would work for that simply because, from what I've seen, wow. Swarm Intelligence works best on what we would classify as intuition, which is you have to make a decision now, and you go with instinct, oh, rather than okay. be, uh, being able to think about it. So this, oh, sad that this wouldn't be useful for informed decision making. No, because of the pressure of the moment. Again, having that, only, that, that 60 seconds, and that's the, the only amount of time you have to make an informed decision. Mm. And we, and our sh our attention spans are short enough as it is, so hmm, this kind of rewards that behavior. I don't, I'm not digging that. Though it might, in uh. the future, be able to be developed to allow for better, more it, comprehensive and cognitive abilities. Right now, it's designed for short, for short usage. Yeah. You, you make it a complete change to the political system, and you no longer allow this, you know, months, almost year-long process with the campaigning. You bring it to the nation, and you basically give them that morning. The candidates get up there, they say their piece, and then, like we, you know, you just said, through your instinct, mm -hmm. you have to make that decision right there. Uh, you you build basically a techno democracy, right? And, and and I'm not saying like you throw it all out and that's where we go, but as a test, you know, see how that happens. See how the populace picks. A few times and then see where that ends up going because you know you have that whole thing where you're not pandered to for a year by these candidates who are just trying to win your vote and don't care about you afterwards you know they have this long to present you a topic you know to present you why they're the person and then you have to make that decision snap judgment oh dear they'd actually have to appeal to their logic yes no people are stupid well, in in such a in such a short time period, individual people are stupid. But I mean, we're reading a story about how, as a swarm, we you know we would operate better. Uh, again, I in certain situations, yes, but in in anything that requires an informed decision, no, humans are stupid. I I I can just point to a number of disasters that have happened in our past where you had a mob mentality. Um, swarm intelligence. Uh, Hillsboro immediately comes to mind. Uh, the the horrible tragedy of the the crushing of all those soccer fans. Mm. Uh, again. Yeah, but that's that's mob mentality with no decision decision matrix. True. It's all reactionary. Yeah. Yeah, but you're using reactionary logic to make an important decision as opposed to an informed decision which takes time. Yeah, but with this you're using a guided process yeah. rather than an unguided one so that I can see where you're coming with this, but I can also see because it is a guided process you cut out a lot of that mob mentality idea. I, I would still like to see better trials before we jump onto this. Well, I would, I would, I would say that oh, yeah. uh, we wouldn't end up having bum rush everybody as being one of the decision options. <laughs> you know, or would we? Well, it, it really shouldn't be. It, you know, the, the do no harm thing should be innate in that. But it would all depend on who's phrasing the questions. You know, who's putting that out there. You know, um, actually, this, this might be really handy for should we nuke Russia? <laughs> You have 60 seconds to think because warheads are coming in. Do you really think we should retaliate? Should we nuke Trump? No. Or should we nuke he's, Hillary? Should any he's of this already happen? nuked. He's orange. He <laughs> and on that, we'll move to the next story. Um, okay. NASA has public domained a, a, a 56 formerly patented technologies. Mm-hmm. And it is NASA. in a searchable database. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, let's see. NASA technologies have already been spun off to develop innovations that permeate civilian life in areas including medicine, transportation, and public safety. For example, NASA funding and innovations have been used to improve or develop better prosthetic limbs, anti-icing systems for small aircraft, and landmine removal technologies. Quote, by making these technologies available to the public domain, we are helping foster a new era of entrepreneurship that will gain a place uh, America at the that will again place America at the forefront of high technology manufacturing and economic competitiveness, said Daniel Lockney, uh, NASA's technology transfer program executive. So there's a whole branch of NASA designed to make technologies go from them to the, to the common man. Yep. How awesome is that? This is fantastic. So this yes, there is a, there is a, there is a, full searchable database I, I found two that I'm like I really want to read in these one was a system for controlling a magnetically levitated rotor that's just cool the one other one that got my attention was aerospace laser ignition slash ablation variable high precision thruster uh, uh, mm? that just sounds really cool laser go boom laser go boom right there so, boom. yeah yeah Interesting. Propellant feed system for swirl coaxial injection. Hybrid electromechanical actuator and actuation system. A radio frequency tank. Eigen mode sensor for propellant quantity gauging. Coil system for plasmoid thruster. Very large area slash volume microwave ECR plasma and ion source. Okay. Uh, budding... Uh, science fiction authors. Go this through, is how you science. This is how this you is go, how you bread and butter. Yeah, go through in there, and just build your techno babble out of real words that are real things. I what is a what's plasmoid? What's a plasmoid thruster? I don't even know. But apparently, there's a patent for it. So there it is. Uh, yeah, check this out. It's uh, technology.nasa.gov slash latest slash public domain. Public underscore domain. And uh, yeah, latest gifts to public domain. Technology transfer program. Amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So that's... Thank um, you, NASA. Absolutely. That's fantastic. So with that, I think uh, it's time to... Uh, it's time to end this episode, and then we will get on with uh, with part two, where we will talk about the Supreme Court. We will talk about um, what Hillary has actually uh, planned for us, since mm -hmm. she has been the chosen one and all that, uh, whether we like it or not. And uh, and also some, uh, some other good ideas, uh, and of course uh, some bad ideas along with the HB2. And then, of course, our picks. So that's what you have to look forward to in part B of the show. That would be show 109. I forgot to actually change it up here in the corner, but that's uh, that's my bad. I will do that now. There we go. 108C. 109. Uh, I, I will actually just change it to A. There we go. Okay. <laughs> And uh, and we will see you uh, if you're in the live stream, which, of course, you should be in the live stream. And that way you can talk to us right here in the chat room and tell us uh, tell us all the things like whether or not you can hear us. You know, good things like that. Uh, you can tell us when we're wrong. <laughs> when, yeah, tell us when we're wrong. Tell us when we're right. Chime in. Direct the show uh, to your heart's content. And we would definitely appreciate that. So... With no further ado, smoke them if you got them. We'll see the live audience in about 10 minutes, and we'll see you as soon as you hit next. Bye, everybody. Stop it, Sprocket. You're crazy. Hello, Pugcat. You're crazy. Stop. Let, let go. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> That's on that horrified note, it is intermission.